Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Virtual Grand Round Educational Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ray Grant, Staff Neurologist at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm the moderator for this series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Richard Ransahoff. Dr. Ransahoff is Director of the Neuroinflammation Research Center in the Department of Neurosciences of Lerner Research Institute, Cleveland Clinic. He is also a professor of molecular medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University and a staff neurologist in the Multiple Sclerosis Center at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Ransoff graduated with honors from Bard College in New York with a BA in literature and received his MD degree with honors from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He completed residencies in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Cleveland and in neurology at Cleveland Clinic. From 1984 to 1989, Dr. Ranshoff was a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Timothy Nilsson in the Department of Molecular Biology and Microbiology at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Among his many honors and awards, Dr. Ranshoff received a Physician's Research Training Award from the American Cancer Society, a Harry Weaver Neuroscience Scholarship from the National MS Society, a Clinical Investigator Development Award from the National Institute of Health, the John and Samuel Bard Award in Science and Medicine, the Cleveland Clinic Lerner Research Institute's Award for Excellence in Science, and the Scientific Achievement Award in Basic Clinical Science at the Cleveland Clinic. He's also received the F.E. Bennett Lectureship of the American Neurological Association. Dr. Ransoff was elected to the American Association of Physicians in 2006, and it was uh, nominated as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2007. He is well known as one of the foremost MS immunology researchers in the world and lectures widely on this topic. Dr. Ranshoff's research is focused on the functions of chemokines and chemokine receptors in development and pathology of the nervous system. He also has a long-standing interest in the mechanisms of action of interferon beta. Dr. Ranshoff has received research support from the NIH and the NMSS continuously for more than 20 years. As of 2011, he listed more than 315 citations in PubMed and had edited five books. Dr. Ransahoff will talk today on new research on the immunology of the cerebrospinal fluid compartment and multiple sclerosis. Dr. Ransahoff. Thanks, Alex. I'm Richard Ransahoff. Uh, I'm a neuroinflammation researcher and neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm going to talk today uh, on some of our research on the immunology of events that occur in the cerebrospinal fluid compartment and their relationship to multiple sclerosis pathogenesis. This is an outline of the talk. I'm going to introduce the idea of immune privilege of the central nervous system, and I'm going to review how leukocyte trafficking is involved in what we call immune surveillance, which is basically the immune system keeping track of the health of the body. And then immune responses, which is the immune system reacting if there is a problem. I want to introduce the idea that multiple sclerosis therapies affect leukocyte trafficking and then conclude by reviewing uh, what we think of as a proof of principle uh, experimental study uh, demonstrating that cortical demyelination occurs early in multiple sclerosis and is quite inflammatory. And I'll try to make clear during the course of the talk why that's relevant. So let's start. Multiple sclerosis was an untreatable disease from its first description up until 1993 when the first treatment was introduced, and that was interferon beta. Within the past few years, we've had a dramatic increase in the therapeutic options available for people with MS, and now we have seven main classes of drugs. We have the interferon beta drugs. We have glutarimer acetate, natalizumab, fingolimod, alemtuzumab, dimethylfumarate, and several cytotoxic immunosuppressives. All of these are FDA-approved for treating MS. Their efficacy in an individual patient ranges from really impressive to almost nothing. And at present, we lack biomarkers that would help us match the right patient to the right treatment. So we're by no means at the end of our road of developing uh, therapeutic uh, treatment algorithm 
for patients with MS, but we have sufficient effective options, at least to begin that process. Three of the main drugs that are used for multiple sclerosis, natalizumab, fingolimod, and the interferon beta products, all target leukocyte trafficking. And so I would argue that multiple sclerosis is the best example of disease control by targeting leukocyte trafficking. Now, leukocyte trafficking is involved in the action of the immune system at its very most fundamental level. As we see here in this cartoon of a man showing uh, the heart where it belongs, right in the midline in the chest, uh, and a lymph node, uh, probably a popliteal lymph node in the uh, middle of the leg, uh, the red arrow shows that lymphocytes enter lymph nodes from the blood. They get pumped out of the heart along with arterial blood. They circulate throughout the body. And it may happen that they will enter a lymph node. Lymph nodes are the great crossroads uh, at which all of the transactions of the immune system take place. So cells such as lymphocytes, go in and out of lymph nodes, as you see that red arrow. And then you see the white arrow coming upward to the heart. That is a lymph, that's a lymphocyte returning, uh, ultimately uh, via the lymph and the afferent, uh, sorry, the thoracic duct uh, into the venous blood. Uh, and so the cycle continues as the Lymphocyte circulates from the blood to the lymph node and then back to the blood. But it may happen under some circumstances that there will be a peripheral tissue infection. You see this guy's got a problem on the dorsum of his foot. And infected material, as you know, will drain by the afferent lymphatic into the lymph node. So if the T cell senses some infected material in that lymph node, then it will be capable of initiating an immune response to clear the infection. And the bottom line from this slide is that leukocyte migration from blood to lymph node and then back into the blood is essential for the functioning of the immune system. Now, let's sort of home down on this a little bit more and see how it works. At the upper left, you see a green box that uh, is titled normal tissue, and you see a kind of spidery looking cell right in the middle of that tissue. That's a dendritic cell. And for the purposes of this talk, let's imagine that's skin. A dendritic cell is a specialized kind of macrophage that sits in tissues and waits for infectious material to enter the tissue. If infectious material does enter the tissue, then as you see on the upper right in the red box, inflammation occurs. The dendritic cell will take up the infectious material and it will migrate via the afferent lymphatic into the lymphoid organ. Let's imagine a lymph node, uh, which you see right at the center of this cartoon. In that lymph node, the dendritic cell will look for a T lymphocyte, and it will try to find a T lymphocyte that has the right T lymphocyte antigen receptor to be able to receive a signal from the dendritic cell that there is an infection somewhere in the body. After that occurs, then the T lymphocyte will undergo a tremendous amount of proliferation. Every one of the progeny T lymphocytes recognizes the same antigen as the original one. On the right, you see a black arrow going to an inflamed venule and back to the infected tissue. So the T cell will go back to the infected tissue and initiate a reaction to clear the infection. And then right in the uh, sort of middle left, you see a purple box around another T cell. That is the memory T cell, which will retain immunologic memory of that particular infection 
sometimes for the lifetime of the individual. That's a cell that carries out immune surveillance, and that's one we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk. One of the important principles of the functioning of the immune system is that T cells cannot be activated unless they receive antigenic stimulation, in a sense, served up on a silver platter. That's the meaning of this photograph. And that silver platter is carried by an antigen-presenting cell. So in a, in a more scientific sense or in more scientific jargon, there has to be a cell-cell interaction between a T cell and an antigen-presenting cell to drive an immune response. In fact, T cells get a tremendous amount of information from antigen-presenting cells, and that's illustrated in this cartoon on the left here. So antigen-presenting cells deliver three different kinds of signals to naive T cells. Naive T cells are T cells that have never been stimulated with antigen. The antigen-presenting cells activate the T cells, they deliver survival signals, and they help the T cells differentiate. Now, in the case of antigen-presenting cells and T cells, this process of differentiation involves understanding what type of infection is present and where it came from. So naive T cells ask a number of questions of APCs. First of all, what is this thing? In other words, what is the antigen that you're showing me? Can I recognize it with my antigen receptor? Secondly, is it really dangerous? The antigen-presenting cell sends a number of signals to the T cell to say, this is truly a pathogen. You need to mount an immune response. So it really does inform the T cell of the extent of risk posed by the pathogen. It also tells what type of pathogen is present. Is it a virus, a protozoal worm, a bacteria, is it an intracellular or extracellular bacteria? And finally, the antigen presenting cell tells the T cell where the antigen came from. Where is the infection? Is it in the skin, the gut, the lung, the liver? Or is it in a sterile compartment like the joint or the CNS? So all of that information comes from the antigen presenting cell to the T cell, and then the T cell carries out the immune reaction based on that information. Now let's transition to the organ that we're interested in. Let's talk about the immune privilege of the central nervous system. How do you define immune privilege of the central nervous system? A good deal of that information is on this slide, so let me explain it to you. On the right, you see a kind of a graph, and that graph has a line at the top which shows just the extent of the inflammatory reaction if you use killed bacteria and inject killed bacteria in the skin and monitor the inflammatory reaction by staining and counting the number of inflammatory cells that enter the skin. And what you see is that there's a very, very strong reaction to that challenge, and it lasts right up until the end of the experiment, which is six weeks. By contrast, what you see in the bottom line is that the reaction in the brain is very transient and very wimpy. Uh, it's about only a third of what happens in the skin, maybe even less. And furthermore, it's over within four weeks, whereas the skin reaction is still strong after six weeks. The appearance of the reaction in the brain is shown on the left, and basically what you see is that there are a few inflammatory cells along the needle track where the bacteria was injected, but really nothing else. So why would the most important organ in the body have such a wimpy inflammatory reaction? Well, we don't know the answer to that, but we certainly know it's true. And it tells us two different things. The afferent system by which the brain tells the immune system that something is wrong is both inefficient and slow. 
and by corollary, if there is an immune reaction in the brain, it must be initiated in the periphery. The brain cannot fire up its own immune reaction. So we certainly know that immune reactions occur in the brain. Multiple sclerosis is one such reaction. Viral encephalitis is another. And what these experiments tell us is that those immune reactions must have begun somewhere else in the periphery of the body. So what's the basis of CNS immune privilege? We don't know why it is this way, but we certainly can find out what the cellular basis is. The cellular basis, uh, I think we have to um, establish that by comparison with a more typical immune reaction. So this is similar to the cartoon I showed you before. It shows the hind end of a rodent. And what it shows you is that the afferent arm of the immune response will carry soluble antigen from a spot in the skin to a draining lymph node shown in the kind of greenish arrow um, just by lymphatic drainage so the antigen can float along in the lymph and be trapped in the lymph node or there is a cellular route and the cellular route involves dendritic cells those special macrophages picking up the material taking it into the lymph node and then the efferent arm is leukocytes and antibodies generated as a result of the reaction in the lymph node returning to the skin and clearing the pathogen now, all three of those functions are extremely active in the skin, which needs to be protected against the outside world quite vigorously. But what's missing in the brain is dendritic cells. There is no cell in the brain parenchyma that will pick up an antigen, leave the brain, and find a lymphatic and go into a lymph node to tell the immune system what's going on. That's why the brain cannot initiate immune responses on its own, because it has no dendritic cells. And the soluble route, even though it does exist to some extent in the brain, is much, much less efficient in delivering antigen to lymph nodes and starting an immune response than is the cellular route. So that's the cellular basis of immune privilege. There simply are no dendritic cells in the brain. Now, we said before that immune responses can occur in the brain, and so we know that immune privilege must be able to be overcome for those immune responses to occur. So here's a second type of experiment in which killed bacteria were injected in the brain and left there for two weeks. Subsequently, the investigator immunized the skin with the same killed bacteria and waited another two weeks and then looked at the brain. And different from the previous view, what you now see is an exuberant immune reaction in the brain with cells cuffing around vessels and all kinds of activated cells in the CNS parenchyma. So what's been done here is actually rather remarkable, if you think of it. A deposit of antigen has been placed in the brain, and then the investigator immunized peripherally, essentially telling the peripheral immune system, there's something somewhere in the body, now go find it and react to it. And the appearance of that um, staining tells you that the immune system found this thing, and mounted a reaction. And for contrast, I'm just showing you the wimpy response in the brain if you don't do a peripheral immunization. So again, this has sort of a take-home message for us, this experiment. One take-home message is that the efferent system by which the immune system can find things in the brain, once the immune system knows there's anything in the body uh, that is wrong and begins to search for it, that immune system or that part of the immune system is very efficient. And that means there must be a process of immune surveillance of the central nervous system. 
And that means we have to find that memory cell. Memory cells, central memory cells, are cells that patrol tissue. Um, what is shown on the left there is a postcapillary venule with a central memory cell exiting the postcapillary venule, going into a tissue, patrolling around the tissue looking for infectious material, then using the afferent lymphatic to get into a lymph node and looking for more infectious material. And then, uh, as, as cells do when they leave the uh, lymph nodes, getting back into the blood. So it's blood to tissue to lymph node to blood is the migration pattern of these cells, these central memory cells. And that's a unique migration pattern uh, for any leukocyte in the body. So we went looking for these central memory T cells. And we, in this case, means Pia Kivasek, uh, and these experiments were done more than 10 years ago. Uh, Pia was studying the spinal fluid of healthy individuals, people who had come to have a spinal tap to rule out for something and had been very clearly ruled out and turned out to have a benign course after the spinal tap. So they clearly had no neurologic disease and they had normal spinal fluid and normal uh, workup in all respects. And what Pia did was develop an assay using flow cytometry, which uh, counts every cell in the experiment as an individual dot uh, and characterizes it as naive central memory or a minor group called effector memory. And she compared blood and spinal fluid. And unfortunately, we're missing some of the axes on the uh, spinal fluid panel on the right, but it's the same staining uh, and the same populations of cells on the left in green and on the right in black. And what Pia found, surprisingly enough, was that most of all the cells that we find in the spinal fluid of healthy people, and you remember you always find around two cells per microliter in healthy spinal fluid. All of those cells are T lymphocytes, virtually all of them, and they are all of that central memory character. So the cells that might be carrying out immune surveillance of the CNS can be found in spinal fluid and spinal fluid of healthy people. Furthermore, you never find these cells in the brain. Even when there's a brisk in inflammation in the brain, the only T cells you find there are effector memory cells. So these central memory cells are present in the CNS only in spinal fluid. So now we can come up with a sort of an idea how immune surveillance of the CNS might work. Immune surveillance of the CNS might be carried out by central memory CD4 T cells in the spinal fluid. Those cells would enter the spinal fluid right where the spinal fluid is made, across the choroid plexus, that organ deep within the ventricles, which makes spinal fluid. And they would exit across the cribriform plate at the base of the brain where the olfactory new nerve rootlets come in. Spinal fluid is known to percolate out. It gets into the nasal mucosa and eventually will find an afferent lymphatic and get into deep cervical lymph nodes. So in the broad view these cells, these central memory T cells, will start in the blood, in the stroma of the choroid plexus, by that number two. They will cross the choroid plexus epithelium, which is the cartoon. In the cartoon, it's, that epithelium is at the top of the villi, or the villus that you see in the cartoon by the big number two. And they'll enter the spinal fluid. Ultimately, after surveying the surface of the nervous system, those T cells will find their way into the uh, portion of the brain under the frontal lobes and percolate out along the cribriform plate and get back into a lymph node and then back into the blood. 
So they have the same trafficking pattern as we expect for central memory T cells. Now, what do they do when they're floating around in the spinal fluid? Well, they're interacting with components of the meninges. The meninges, as you know, are the lining membranes for the subarachnoid space, the, the spinal fluid space. And they're composed uh, in the cartoon at the top. You see the dura. Underneath the dura, you see the arachnoid. And then you see a bunch of uh, stromal cables connecting the arachnoid to the pia, which is right over the surface of the tissue. And but down near the uh, uh, peel surface, you have a number of vessels which either penetrate into the parenchyma or remain in the pia, and they may be either peel vessels or sub-peel vessels, um, which feed both the meninges and ultimately the brain. So as those T cells are floating through the CSF, they have the opportunity to interact with the elements of the meninges. And it turns out that all of that vasculature and all of the surfaces of those vessels are studded with antigen-presenting cells, meningeal macrophages, which have the ability to sample the contents of the CSF and get a broad array of antigens to present to the T cells floating by so that if there is a pathogen or a tumor cell somewhere in the tissue, an antigen from that material will get out to the meningeal macrophages, and that can be used to alert T cells passing by to the presence of a problem. What you see at the bottom uh, is a cross-sectional confocal image showing in the parenchyma a variety of green microglia and in the meninges a variety of red and yellow T cells and macrophages inter interacting with each other. Uh, this happens to be a, an animal with very brisk inflammation. So after Pia completed her postdoc with me, uh, she went to Harvard and continued working on this problem, and ultimately she obtained direct evidence that immune surveillance of the central nervous system is indeed carried out by central memory T cells. And she wrote a paper which was published in 2009 in Annals of Neurology called Localizing CNS Immune Surveillance. So let's look at a little bit of uh, the, the, the paper. Before we go there, uh, I just want to emphasize that when cells are trafficking to the CNS, there are two completely different routes that they will use to get there and they go there for completely different reasons. At the top, you see a central memory T cell squeezing out of the stroma of the, of the uh, choroid plexus and crossing the choroid plexus epithelium-tight junctions to get into the spinal fluid. That's a central memory T cell doing physiological trafficking in a healthy brain just for the purpose of immune surveillance. At the bottom, you see effector memory T cells and activated macrophages interacting with the vessels of the blood-brain barrier, not the blood-spinal fluid barrier, and crossing into the parenchyma uh, either to eliminate a pathogen, if this is an infection, or to initiate an autoimmune disease injury uh, if this is a condition like multiple sclerosis. What Pia was able to do was figure out a way to strip the meninges off of the spinal cords of mice uh, and label the antigen-presenting cells red and the lymphocytes green and then make movies and from those movies extract a bunch of still photographs of antigen-presenting cells and T-cells interacting in the meninges of a mouse. 
this set of images comes from the meninges of a healthy mouse. And so what you see at the upper left is a green round T cell and a kind of spread out red antigen presenting cell. In the next image, in the middle at the top, in the top row, you see that the T cell is beginning to make a big flat process and it is using that process to scan the surface of the antigen presenting cell. That's how T cells look for antigen, by scanning the surfaces of antigen presenting cells. That process continues on the top right and also on the middle left image. At that point, the T cell has not found anything of interest because this is a healthy mouse. There's no infection, there's no autoimmunity going on. So it pulls back that process. It goes to the next antigen presenting cell over and extends another process. And it scans that other antigen presenting cell. You can see that in the very middle image in the middle row and the right hand image in the middle row and also the first image on the left in the bottom row. Finally, it doesn't find anything on that antigen presenting cell either because this is a healthy mouse. So it pulls back the process, becomes round, and eventually leaves the picture. All of this just takes a couple of seconds. These are cells after all, and a couple of seconds is a long time in the lifetime of a cell. In a mouse that's developing autoimmunity, the situation is completely different. EAE, it means Experimental Autoimmune Encephalomyelitis, and that's an mouse model for the inflammatory events that occur during the human disease, multiple sclerosis. In the case of EAE, mice are injected with components from their own myelin membrane, and they develop autoimmunity to that myelin membrane. And about two and a half weeks after the immunization, they will develop inflammation in the spinal cord and paralysis, similar to what happens in people with MS. So it's a fine model for that aspect of the disease. We know that T cells eventually enter the CNS of mice with EAE, but we don't know what happens right before they enter, and Pia was able to capture that in some of her movies. So these images come from a mouse that is about a week short of getting sick with EAE. So it's perfectly healthy at this point, but it has been immunized, and uh, this mouse was sacrificed, but if it wasn't, it would have gotten sick about a week after these images were taken. Again, Pia has stripped off the meninges. She's stained the T cells green and the antigen presenting cells red, watched them interacting, and took movies. And what you see here is that all nine images are identical. The T cell and the APC really don't change their uh, orientation to each other or their shape. Uh, or their location in any of those nine images. If you look at the numbers in the upper left-hand corner of each one of the images, what you see is the movie starts at zero seconds and goes to 4,300 seconds. So that's about an hour and 15 minutes that these two T cell that these two cells are stuck together, and that's a lifetime uh, for a cell. So. These cells are having a very intense interaction based purely on the T cell recognizing a myelin antigen on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. And in the uh, sort of, sort of uh, blotchy images to the right, um, Pia is simply taking pictures of how closely those, t those two cells are stuck to each other. Uh, this is a cartoon from another study that came out in 2009 showing all of the events that occur after those two cells interact in the meninges, usually on the surface of a peel vessel. Uh, what you see here 
is a whole bunch of T cells crawling around on the surface of a peel vessel. The T cells are these kind of uh, oblong greenish objects. The vessel is in blue. Uh, the pia is in gray, and what looks like a mattress under the pia uh, is the spinal cord tissue. Um, this, again, is cartoons taken from a series of uh, similar movies to the one that Pia took. And it shows that after interacting with the meningeal macrophages, the T cells acquire a wandering behavior, which eventually will take them into the spinal cord parenchyma, where they will initiate the attack on myelin and ultimately uh, the hind limb paralysis. So now we need to know about the molecules that support these processes. Um, about 20 years ago, two investigators, Springer and Butcher, divided the steps in leukocyte migration out of the vessel into arbitrary stages so that they could identify the molecules that support each one of these stages of interaction. Uh, so they called them rolling activation adhesion and diapedesis. And then in the orange boxes at the bottom are some of the molecules that support these processes. Uh, this is maybe a more detailed view of how this process works and a sort of a more graphic cartoon showing some of these molecules. The, the molecules that are shown on the top uh, row, uh, the lipid bilayer sort of in the middle with all the things coming out of it, that's meant to be the leukocyte membrane. And at the bottom is the endothelial cell membrane that the leukocyte's interacting with. The rolling stage uses any one of about five different molecules. The activation stage uses any one of about 50 different molecules. And the arrest stage, again, uses any one of about five different molecules. These are all different molecules, and all you need is one for rolling, one for activation, and one for arrest. And so taking one from column A, one from column B, one from column C, you find that different leukocytes can use a wide variety of different molecules to support the process of specific migration under specific circumstances out of the vasculature and into tissue. And this is the reason why we are able to get very specific reactions. So for example, if we get a bacterial infection, we will almost always get a neutrophil infiltrate. If we get a viral or fungal interaction, uh, infection, we will almost always get a monocyte macrophage infiltrate. And that's because the leukocytes get signals which tell them whether they are in the right place at the right time to migrate out of the vasculature into tissue. One of the most powerful drugs that we have to target leukocyte trafficking is called natalizumab. And natalizumab is a monoclonal antibody which specifically binds to one of those arrest molecules, an integrin on the leukocyte. Each integrin has two chains, an alpha and a beta chain. And natalizumab recognizes the alpha-4 chain of integrins on leukocytes and blocks their migration out of the bloodstream and into tissue. And that's the basis of its action uh, in treating multiple sclerosis and other diseases. So let's take now just a quick summary look at how leukocyte homing works. I mentioned that a leukocyte needs one from column A, one from column B, one from column C in order to decide whether it's the right time and place to leave the blood vessel. So the way that the leukocytes do this is in sequence. It says, first of all, if you look at the memory cell on the left, that cell enters this vessel. It looks for the first signal, the rolling signal, does not find it, and as soon as it 
doesn't find the rolling signal, it knows that it's in the wrong place to leave the bloodstream, and it just keeps going by. The PMN, the neutrophil, finds the rolling signal, begins rolling. That's shown in those sort of uh, um, uh, swirly arrows in the middle. Uh, and then it looks for an activation signal, but does not find it. And so it does not stop and just keeps rolling right on out of the picture. So neither one of those cells is going to enter the uh, tissue under this particular vessel. The next cell that comes through is a naive T cell. And it turns out that this vessel is the entry point to a lymph node. So that naive T cell does receive the rolling signal. So you see the green yes box. It begins rolling looks for the activation signal, and it does get the activation signal. Once it's gotten that, it will stop, arrest, and it will look for signals in the tissue to eventually detach from the vessel wall and migrate right into the tissue. So that's how homing works. It's sequential recognition of these three different signals. So since we were mentioning this special type of blood vessel, high endothelial venules, and the fact that they represent the entry point to lymph nodes. So let's take a look inside the lymph node and see what happens once the cell is in there. So you can see on the left here the blood in the middle of the lymph node, and on the right the efferent lymph. A T cell will come into the lymph node and it will look for something to activate it, an antigen on a dendritic cell. That's shown in sort of the lower left middle part uh, where you see the T cell with the, word, with the word ACT on it. That means activated. T cells that do or do not become activated within lymph nodes both have on their surfaces receptors called S1P1. That's a sphingosine 1-phosphate type 1 receptor. And regardless whether the cell does or doesn't become activated, they need that S1P1 receptor to get out of the lymph node because the way that cells leave lymph nodes, which is shown at the right here, involves their recognizing a large amount of S1P in the efferent lymph or in the blood, and a small amount of S1P in the lymph node. And they always follow from low concentration to high concentration. So they receive signals through that S1P type 1 receptor, and that gets them out of a lymph node. Fingolimod, which is a drug used for treating MS, will downregulate those receptors and block the ability of either naive or activated memory T cells to leave lymph nodes and get to where they're going. And that's the basis of fingolimod's efficacy in treating MS. It turns out that interferon beta acts in somewhat the same way. Interferon beta will activate the expression of a molecule called CD69 on the surfaces of lymphocytes. CD69, once it's expressed on the membrane of the lymphocyte, will reach over, find the S1P receptor, the S1P type 1 receptor, and suppress its function. And so interferon beta treatment ultimately will trap lymphocytes and lymph nodes in much the same way that fingolimod does. And in either case, they become unavailable to enter the inflamed central nervous system and cause damage in multiple sclerosis. So that's a complete summary of how leukocyte trafficking blockade can be used to treat multiple sclerosis. Now we want to turn our attention to asking whether this idea about immune surveillance and immune activation within the central within the CSF has anything to do with early pathogenesis of MS. And that brings us to this paper 
inflammatory cortical demyelination in early multiple sclerosis. This was a collaboration between our lab and Claudia Lucanetti, who is shown on the right and works at the Mayo Clinic. The workers in my lab were Natalia Mole, who finished this project and now is on the faculty of the University of Marseille in France, and Anna Reach, who remains as a technologist in the lab. We started with the point that MS lesions are very closely associated with the CSF flow pathways. You know that MS lesions are periventricular, so they're right near the ventricles where the CSF flows. What you may not be as aware of is that the remainder of the MS lesions are in the cortex over the convexities, so they are also in or near the CSF flow pathways. Furthermore, when I talked to you about EAE before, I didn't mention that EAE lesions in the spinal cord are also near the CSF flow pathways. In this case, they are in the subpeal region of the spinal cord. So in all those cases, both EAE and MS, we're particularly interested in the subpeal regions of the tissue right next to where the spinal fluid is flowing. So our view of MS pathogenesis, just like in EAE, involves a memory T cell, the purple thing at the top left, and an APC, the bluish thing at the top right, interacting with each other, initiating signals to the reactive cells in the underlying cortex, the astrocytes and the microglial cells, which will then begin these pathogenic activities that result in damage to central nervous system myelin, which is shown coding the uh, axone of the neuron right in the middle there, uh, and also causing damage to oligodendrocytes, as well as activating vessels deeper, deeper within the cortex or in the white matter to propagate this inflammation inward. So this brings us to the topic of cortical demyelination. Cortical demyelination is surprisingly prevalent in MS. We always think MS is a, is a white matter disease because it's a myelin disease, but there's myelin in the cortex, and almost all autopsy cases of MS show quite a lot of cortical demyelination. The cortex has less myelin than the white matter, but as a percentage of its total myelin, the cortex is more demyelinated than white matter in these autopsy cases. And why don't we know more about cortical demyelination? Well, first of all, because conventional MRI can't see cortical lesions. And secondly, because the old-fashioned myelin tissue stains, such as Luxol Fast Blue, also don't show cortical lesions. Now, there have been some autopsy studies of cortical demyelination, but these patients died after many years of progressive disease, and their demyelinating lesions in the MS autopsy material showed almost no lymphocytes or macrophages. It was startlingly uninflammatory. So could it be that cortical demyelination is completely different from white matter demyelination? Could there be a primary neurodegeneration in the cortex? Now, arguing against that idea, MRI studies indirectly showed that the cortex is involved very early in MS, not just in the neurodegenerative stage. In fact, the cortex begins to shrink very early in MS. So some form of damage is going on but the MRI scanner was not able to show what the damage looked like or to find lesions. So we studied cortical demyelination in biopsy cases from early relapsing remitting MS cases. How did we do that? Well, every so often in big medical centers, uh, a case will be sent in either uh, having had a biopsy or maybe sent in as a... Uh, as a pathology consult in which a biopsy was taken because a white matter lesion looked a lot like a tumor. 
This is called tumefactive MS lesion. And these are usually sampled by stereotactic transcortical biopsy. So the needle goes in through the cortex, targeted to a white matter lesion, and then comes out and may take a little core of cortex with it. That's shown in green in that tissue core shown in the cartoon in the upper right. So in collaboration with Claudia Lucanetti's group, we undertook to study this cortical demyelination. Claudia had 563 biopsy cases that she screened for cortex, and she found cortex, as you see in the middle, in 138 cases. Of those, 38% showed some degree of cortical demyelination, or CDM, and the other 62% didn't. We thought this was pretty amazing because those biopsy cores of cortex are only about a millimeter in diameter. So this is a kind of random biopsy of a millimeter of cortex showing demyelination 40% of the time uh, when taken from an MS biopsy. Uh, the rest of these flow charts simply make the point that these cases then went on to have typical relapsing remitting MS in the vast majority of cases, something like 75 to 80 percent of all the cases. So what did these look like? These are tissue sections from those biopsies. And in the upper left, you see a panel called LK, leukocortical. And that means that the lesion began in the white matter and spills into the cortex. In the upper right, you see a completely different type of lesion called SP, or subpeel. That's a lesion that starts at the peel surface and simply descends down through layers of cortex, typically three layers, into the cortical myelin. Lower left is IC, that means intracortical. It's a small, punched-out lesion entirely within the cortex. And a particularly interesting one is seen at the lower right. That's a subpeal lesion nearby to another leukocortical or almost entirely white matter lesion. It was important to us to see these patterns of lesion uh, distribution because they're exactly the same as John Peterson and Bruce Trapp described 10 years before in their studies of autopsy cases of MS. So we knew we had typical cortical lesions. So our results showed that cortical demyelinating lesions are present in 38% of biopsies with an average of two lesions per biopsy. And the distribution of lesion type was about 50% leukocortical, 15% intracortical, and 35% subpeal. Now, we thought in order to be fair when we're doing our frequency calculation, we should throw out the leukocortical lesions because they might have had signal abnormalities right near the lesion, uh, the cortical lesion, on MRI. And in fact, that might have targeted the biopsy needle. So the only ones we counted were intracortical, 8%, and subpeal, 11% uh, of all the cases. And that still left us with 19% of these random fragments of cortex having cortical demyelination at a distance from the white matter lesion that led to biopsy. So we think Dawson was right that ultimately Lesions are centered on vessels, but we think the vessels are activated by this early in interaction between memory T cells and APCs, shown at the top middle here, uh, within the meninges, eliciting cytokine fluxes that activate the vessels in the cortex and in the white matter. And here's a, what we think a remarkable image of a subpeal lesion on the surface of the tissue uh, right adjacent to a perivascular lesion deeper within the tissue. It looks just like our cartoon to us. These lesions are extremely inflammatory, so they are nothing like the burnt out 
autopsy lesions that had previously been reported. They have abundant uh, perivascular cuffs of CD3 T cells, CD8, and CD4 T cells, even occasional B cells in the lower right. The demyelination is certainly mediated by macrophages, as shown in these images, just like in a white matter lesion. And so we think the only difference between the lesions we're describing is that they're fresh lesions showing the ongoing pathology in contrast to the autopsy lesions in which all of the uh, invading lymphocytes have died or left, leaving essentially just a burnt out end stage lesion. So in conclusion, T lymphocyte trafficking is at the heart of all immune responses. In that sense, lymphocyte trafficking is a well-validated treatment strategy for inflammatory disease, as already proven in the case of multiple sclerosis. If we study carefully and thoughtfully, we can figure out in each setting what molecules support the process of T-cell trafficking, and therefore, it's reasonable to target this process because it can be done relatively selectively for treating inflammatory diseases. Of course, the specific targets and predicted complications are going to differ depending on what the disease is. So there's a couple of new ideas here. One is that immune surveillance of the CNS takes place in the subarachnoid space. Two is that in the Healthy human being CSF cells are about 90% T cells, and they have the surface characteristics and behavior of central memory T cells. They're the cells that carry out immune surveillance. Uh, and these cells will search for antigen presented by meningeal macrophages and to some extent by choroid plexus macrophages. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Ranzhoff, for an elegant and important review of your research and that of others. This research has changed our conception of MS pathogenesis and the anatomic and immune basis of MS lesion burden. While for many years the cerebral spinal fluid was considered a passive sink for waste products of the brain, your group has clearly delineated the exquisite complexity of immune surveillance in this compartment. You've shown us that the immune system is very much engaged in this area. From the groundbreaking work you and others have done, we now know that cortical lesions are common early in MS and are a part of the overall disease pattern in this disease. This work, while at present at a very basic science level, may well lead to approaches to disease treatment which address the peel surface of the brain or the CSF compartment itself, recognize the importance of these areas for early MS injury. By helping us rethink this disease, you and your colleagues are opening up new pathways to monitor, measure, and modify this mysterious disorder. Thanks once again for your patience in presenting a complex topic with such lucidity. Thanks again for participating in this segment of our MS Virtual Grand Round series. Please remember to fill out your evaluations for CME credit.